Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to this Surface Ventures workshop in partnership with Brooker. So before we go any further, and just to uh, check that we're coming through loud and clear to you, could you please write where you're joining us from in the chat? It'd be nice to see uh, see where you're all from. I've got uh, about 10 people with us currently. I'm sure there'll be more joining soon. Uh, Hello and good morning to Mohammed and Ali, who have already written in the chat. So while we're just waiting for that to come in, we'll just uh, give a quick introduction. I am Sam McMaster, the event manager here at Surface Ventures, and I'll be your host for this session today. Surface Ventures is a non-for-profit organization, and our mission is to provide world-class surface engineering education for academia and industry. So every month, we will bring you a sector leading speaker to present the current challenges and future trends in the field of surface engineering alongside, like we have today, uh, workshops uh, with equipment demonstrations. All right, we've got a couple more people saying hello. So that's, that's always good. Glad, glad to see uh, all that is in place. So. Okay, just one moment. So now let's get on to introductions for our speaker, Damien uh, Ku of Rooker Nanosurfaces and Metrology. So Damien is a research engineer at Brooker whose work focuses on understanding the physiochemical mechanisms of materials and developing new testing methodologies for material research and characterization. His expertise includes project design man uh, and management, data analysis and interpretation, and the development and implementation of scientific instrumentation. Okay, so in terms of agenda, we will start with our speaker's presentation in a moment. So this will include a video demonstration of the Tribal Lab HD uh, before we move on to our Q&A session uh, towards the end of the event. Uh, with regards to questions, please type these in the chat and I will mark those for the uh, Q&A session. Um, and we're planning to go for a maximum of 60 minutes today. Uh, we will be offering attendance certificates uh, for those of you who are with us in live. The link uh, to generate your attendance certificate will be shared with you later in the event. A uh, quick question about our, uh, or sorry, quick question, apologies. Quick reminder about our website, uh, surfaceventures.org. So we have videos from previous talks, information regarding the uh, upcoming webinars, and further information about our team. So now let's just quickly uh release a little poll question to learn a little bit more about you our audience so just ask what stage of your career you are at so that is on screen now so with that uh i'd like to hand over to damien and invite him on stage hi good good morning sam good morning okay Greetings and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. So uh, my name is Damien, and the talk today is going to be about brake testing, and which uh, we're going to demonstrate some a few of the brake test methods that uh, we used to characterize the frictional properties of uh, brake materials. So I'll begin my presentation. Uh, the agenda will be from introduction and sharing of different types of brick test methods, followed by how we use the Tribal Lab HD as a small scale test uh, thing method, share some results that I've collected recently and do a quick summary before we proceed with the Q&A session. So I think with everyone in the platform today, we are in our daily life, transportation is one of the most important sectors regardless of our ge geographical location and societal needs. So over the years, you see that the increasing number of vehicles on the road coupled with uh, evolving vehicle architecture, especially electric vehicles is blooming in the recent years and the coming years. These two factors will continue to drive the steady growth uh, of the brake material market, as we can see the, the survey that has been done. So the brake material market is expected to grow steadily across every region in the world, uh, with a total market size surpassing $12 billion by 2029. So with more and more vehicles on the road, we, we would expect 
more traffic congestion and environmental effect that would change the landscape of brake material industry, right? Where brake developers are expected to continuously put forward new formulations, new brake materials uh, to meet the market demands, which strive for better performance, road safety, driving efficiency, uh, and control. For brake developers, uh, those who are in the OEM and also the aftermarket uh, brake developer industry, the shorter the time to market, the quicker the return on investment. Uh, however, testing is a critical aspect that brake developers cannot neglect. So testing is paramount for all the formulations, uh, prototypes that's being done. So stringent tests are paramount to ensure that the brake materials are performing and reliable and compliant to local and international road safety and environmental regulations when it comes to like Euro 7 in terms of emission particles, uh, etc. And more importantly, the uh, brake developers, the tribological characteristics of the brake materials must be tested such that they meet the desired requirements, especially in terms of brake effectiveness, uh, coefficient of frictions, and etc. To date, there are several methods for brake friction material testing. And the most uh, common, of course, uh, is the vehicle test, uh, which we put on the brake system, the brake materials onto a brake system, and put it to test on the road. Uh, the test is being done on actual vehicle. And this, I would say that this is the only test that gives truly reliable data, because we are actually based on actual on the road driving. Uh, however, if a uh, Vehicle test is not only that it's expensive, time consuming, uh, it's also subjected to the results actually subjected to the condition on the road or the track that the vehicle is driving on, as well as the weather condition will actually affect uh, the test uh, results. So having uh, to say to say that uh, in the manufacturing industry where quality control is done on a daily basis, a vehicle test is not uh, that practical in, in terms of uh, quality control in the, in the earlier stage. Uh, this is where uh, the use of an inertia dynamometer to evaluate brake system performance is more feasible than uh, vehicle testing. So all, all this while, uh, inertia dynamometer, it has, has been an industry standard to benchmark performance of uh, brake material such as uh, the test in the SAE J2522, which uh, I'm going to demonstrate how we are going to simulate this test on a small scale tester that uh, Broker is, has recently introduced. See, although uh, initial dynamometer, it's a fully instrumented system, it's a large system that is instrumented for speed, applied pressure, torque and temperature. Uh, the results, uh, that's collected from an inertia dynamometer, it supports the understanding of uh, testing vehicle results. It's similar to, to what a actual vehicle test. Uh, but for brake early adopters, especially brake material uh, developers and researchers, you might find this uh, method complex in the, in the sense that uh, if we are developer are actually developing brake pads or rotor disks, what you're interested more is to the tribological properties of the material itself, rather than assessing the entire brake system that on what you could assess on an initial dynamometer, where full scale uh, hardware effect, such as the caliper deflection of the some parts of the in the brake hardware would, would somehow affect the properties of the brake pads or the rotor disc. And other than that, the test of is going to be long, one to two days of testing, besides having to have to the need of large and expensive system. So although this is uh, the initial dynamometer has been a standard test to benchmark the performance, uh, but for research at early adopters, especially the those uh, brake material developer and researcher, they would want something that is more simplified, uh, that can, that is easier to be executed and the test conditions can be uh, controlled. This is where we have the 
third level of uh, testing, which is the standard test on small scale test specimen. And the small scale test specimen over here, we are referring to the brick pad and the rotor disc. We are uh, disregarding the brick calipers uh, and, on, uh, or, and all other hardware aspect. So for a uh, reduced scale tester, small scale tester like the Bruker Traveler HD, it's, it actually provides screening of friction material during early stages of formula, formula development, which we base on deceleration tests similar to that of uh, what is being required in the SAE J2522 test. Uh, it eliminates full scale hardware effects. So uh, early adopters or brake developers, you're actually characterizing only the tribological properties of the friction materials, brake pad and rotor disc. Uh, while we are using a smaller sample size, that is to ensure a contact pressure, uniform contact pressure distribution. However, the biggest challenge is that there are a few other uh, small scale testers of the industry that's been used. So one of the biggest challenge is to re replicate all the system parameters of a dynamo monitor test. We are we don't seek to re substitute a dyno test because dyno test is needed. But uh, a reduced scale will help those who are in the R&D or in the, in the academia doing research on uh, fr friction materials. So uh, what we adopt, a strategy that we adopt for this tribal FHD is the scaling of test parameters. We try to match those of the dynamometer to the as much as possible, which I'm going to demonstrate in the next few slides. And more importantly, is to achieve accurate and re repeatable uh, friction uh, measurement. So this brings us to the primary focus of uh, this webinar. That is to demonstrate the capability of uh, Tribal Lab HD, which is the latest technological innovation built by Broker. We just launched it like two, two to three weeks ago. Uh, and this specific for those who are looking for rapid yet accurate and reliable small scale friction material testing. So in our recent study, we evaluated the brick effectiveness of several aftermarket brick pads. We purchased a commercial off the shelf brick pads and we evaluate them. So typically to set up an evaluation test, the evaluation to determine tribological properties of friction materials needs to first uh, define five most important tribal elements, we should call it, which is the material, contact geometry, loading, motion and environment. So for, for our case, uh, we what we do is we get the actual brake pad from a passenger car, as you can see on this image, and we cut it or we extract it into smaller sizes of 12.7 millimeters in diameter in round round coupons. That gives us about uh, three, we use three pieces on the, on the on each test such that we will give a more homogeneous representation of the brick pad because by nature uh, in general the actual brick pad from a car is non-homogeneous and this tribal this tribal pair will be the second part of it will be the rotor disc that is uh, made from a gray cast iron finish to 320 grit. So these are the tribal pair that's going that's, that we use to evaluate the effectiveness subsequently in this test. In terms of contact geometry, like uh, I've described in the earlier slides, we use three coupons from each brake pad to give an average representation of the material. One of the purpose is to, of course, to capture the inhomogeneity of the brake microstructure from a huge piece to a small piece. So the brake pad are being mounted on the brake coupon holder, as you can see on the image on the right. And it's going to be driven by a servo motor to, pre to press it against a, rot a rotating rotor disc. So we are going to use the rotational stage over here to uh, mimic deceleration. So we use an electric motor to drive the stage up to a certain speed and then decelerate down to, to, the, release, to the release speed that we want to test. So in this, uh, evaluation, we try to simulate the 
front brake of a 1990 Volkswagen Golf, uh, where the tire radius, piston area, rotor radius, and the actual brake pad area in this test, these parameters are basically based on this model of vehicle. While applying a uh, contact pressure on the brake pads, similar to that of the AK Master test, uh, where we have various uh, contact pressure ranging for as low as one megapascal all the way up to eight megapascal. This is to maintain a one-to-one -one relationship so that the coefficient of friction or the test results will be more comparable and we can see similar trends. So equivalent magnitude of uh, applied load required, they are calculated based on the area of the piston area, area of samples and area of the brake pads. So uh, we have the software that would help us to do all the calculations and sim give a simulate uh, set of test parameters that we can just directly use for the simulation. In terms of motion, when the sliding, when the brake pad is pressed against the rotating rotor, this is a unidirectional sliding. And the motor provides artificial deceleration based on AK Master. So that is when the Tribola HD drives speed control through, through a driver motor. So stopping time is calculated based on deceleration and initial velocity. So for example, over here, as you can see on the right on the screen, speed which means that first the motor will be driven up to 80 kilometers per hour and then the loading will happen the brake pad will get will be applied to the rotor disc at a pressure of 3 megapascal contact pressure and the motor will slowly decelerate down to 30 kilometers per hour so during this duration the torque value the coefficient of friction uh, as a result of this deceleration would be collected and being uh, presented. So an example of uh, <coughs> calculation that's based on a 0.27G basic passenger car uh, is being established for this particular test. But through, of course, through, throughout the entire AK Master test, there are a variety of uh, test conditions that uh, we will simulate. In terms of environment for this test, it's dry. <clears throat> we don't mimic any uh, on the route uh, conditions such as uh, water, mud, and things, etc. Uh, but at the same time, we do measure the temperature of the brake pad and the temperature of the rotor disc. And the test initiation, as requested, required by the AK Master, is dictated by the rotor temperature. Test will start when the the rotor this achieve a certain temperature. So for us, for our case, we use an in-situ heater to reach a certain temperatures, elevated temperature range, uh, especially during the fade and temperature pressure sensitivity sections, uh, where we have direct heating on the rotor disc, and we minimize the heating on the brake pad so that the uh, material integrity of the brake pad is not affected by the thermal uh, degradation or uh, change of uh, behavior. At the same time, and uh, dust part brake particles has been generated from this sliding test. Uh, they can be collected. They are collected uh, using a cascade impactor and then being analyzed for the particle size distribution and element analysis, uh, which has been, uh, this part of this study is getting more and more attention in especially uh, environmental uh, regulations and non-exhaust uh, non emission uh, particulates are getting attention in the, in the uh, community in the recent years. Right, so uh, once these five tribal elements, material, contact geometry, loading, motion, and environment are being properly set up, we are ready to start the test. So the next slide, we will show a, a short video on how the test uh, that encompasses all these five elements are being, uh, how the test is uh, being carried out using the uh, small scale tester on the Tribal Lab HD. So yeah, the video would come out. We'll show you.
and now we're applying the contact pressure of 3 megapascal while the motor starts and once we reach the the pressure is lifted and the test just uh, repeats itself until it completes the test sequences that uh, we initially uh, executed so I'll video now and we will move on to the test results. So once the test is completed, all the results are recorded and we're going to present it. Uh, I'm going to share some of the findings that we get from this uh, evaluation of a few of these uh, after uh, market break pads. The entire, so uh, in our studies, we actually simulated the entire flow of the SAE G2522, which is the AK master test. So I took out a few of the of the test conditions or test parameters as being extracted from the AK master standard. And this is what we actually uh, mimic either through different pre, uh, different contact pressure where we will check, we will vary the load that's going to be applied onto the disk as well as uh, we're going to make use of the heater to perform a uh, fit test at mount various temperatures require, required from 100 all the way up to 550 uh, degrees Celsius. A, a plot that uh, that's been collected when it's plotted is actually an all-in-one deceleration plot that is easy to interpret uh, for just briefly go through over here as you can see on the red line when we have a speed of zero to driving up to two to about 2100 uh, rpm this is actually equivalent to 80 kilometers per hour and when we reach this what we call the initial speed uh, the pressure pressure the you start to move the get the pad to get into contact with the rotor this we apply a pressure about uh, for this case, particularly, is 0.75 megapascal of contact pressure, which is equivalent to 300 newton on our system. So force and speed are controlled. So uh, while torque and temperatures are monitored, where at the same time we monitor the temperature of the pad, temperature of the rotor, and the torque, which is the torque is then used to calculate the determine the brake effectiveness throughout the deceler deceleration test. So the the region that we are interested in is shown in the arrow on the double headed arrow on the top where is the that's where the deceleration is and there is also where the top the coefficient coefficient of frictions are, are calculated so an example of, of all the complete tests that we have done for one particular brake pad uh, we, the report the temp this report is presented similar to what we get from a dynamometer test consisting of 15 different steps and many sub steps to evaluate the friction performance of brake under uh, different conditions we have the green the burnish basically is the, the the burning in of it fade and of course of at different uh, speeds and so on so uh, the results from the traveler hd reduced scale test we observe a complete cycle of the AK master test so brake as on the axis on the left the braking torque applied pressure rotor these temperatures they were plotted to provide a clear overview on the brake material performance under various simulated driving scenarios and in general if I look at this graphs of this plot this co the coefficient of frictions uh, were rather stable and are within expected values in all the test cycles. This is the first part of the 
test and the second page that reports uh, which reports more more focus on the measured friction and temperatures from uh, we have the fit test a few of the <coughs> temperature pressure sensitivity uh, sections so this provide a clear representative of the material, friction material combina uh, combination <coughs> but for if let's say we are there are, um, the next slide I'm going to show a, a few of these individual sections which I find interesting so, uh, but in general, we can say that the scaling philosophy and the tester design in this test is well demonstrated for initial development and testing of uh, brake uh, materials, brake pads, brake rotors. So for instance, uh, between these two slides, there's this fade one in 6.9, that's on the third row of this image. And also on the second row on the second image is the fade two. So if these two, graphs of interest we extract the graphs out and we're trying to compare how the break effectiveness are being affected at elevated temperature from 100 degrees celsius going up all the way to 550 degrees celsius so uh, having this type of side-by-side -side comparison of this one type of break pads between fake one and fake two uh, initial deduction or conclusion that we can make is the we can actually determine the thermal fit behavior of big materials is determined from the coefficient of friction of the fit in both fit one and fit two, how they change at elevated temperature. So to match the dynamometer test, the Tribolab HD provides direct heating of the rotor disc. So to mimic a friction induced heat scenario. Our samples is uh, small, so we need to have supply them with external heat. Uh, such that we can bring the rotor disc temperature up to the elevated temperature that's required in the fit testing. Uh, a, a general approach that we expected the results is the a typical trend where the friction of coefficient decreases as uh, temperature rises. But moving from fit one to fit two, there is some recovery where the coefficient of friction slightly increased, uh, showing that there is a the brake pad actually recovers after a few of the uh, recovery steps in the, which is uh, shown in this uh, chart on this plot, which shows the fit uh, recovery characteristics. So we, the, the plot over the results over here, the, the green box and the orange box, both represents what happened immediately before the fit and after the fit. And the, 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 the ability of the coefficient of friction of uh, during fade, it decreases. But after, the, during the recovery stage, you can, the friction of coefficient actually recovered back to, all, to almost similar values of what we have before the fade test. So this shows that the brake pad has the ability to uh, minimize friction loss when subjected to extreme elevated temperatures and to return to the pre fit friction level of uh, on cooling. So after cooling, it, the uh, brake effectiveness actually uh, recovered. Good for this is uh, showing that the is a, a fair and a good break. So between fit, even within uh, fit one itself, from the characteristic value three to fit one, there is a drastic drop in the mu, mu value of about 15%. Uh, but after, up, upon cooling, we get a recovery whereby the break effect, the loss of break effectiveness is only about 3% compared to pre, pre fit So from 0 0.52 to 0 0.50 0 something. Yeah, it's about a loss of 3%, but it shows a good uh, recovery trend. And when we subject, we further subjected it to other temperature tests and uh, pressure sensitivity tests. Uh, and then that's where the AK master test will introduce again the same fit test, which we call it the fit two. Uh, that shows uh, improved effectiveness because from the recovery between the recovery two phase to the fit two, the drop is only four percent compared to fit one, there's about 15%. So in the second fit, it's only 4%. And when it recovered post fit, 
the loss is only about 1% compared to the pre pre uh, fate level. Uh, a typical trend that we see on most of the uh, brick pads, uh, organic, uh, metallic, uh, ceramic brick pads. And uh, this, uh, the ability to make such a comparison uh, to study the fate recovery characteristics. So the Tribal Lab HG actually presents a consistent approach for brick developers, <coughs> researchers, to study the brick pad recovery mechanism, whether the, the brick pad would recover normal, normally, there's slow recovery, or it, it may even happen in certain cases over recovery, where the friction coefficient in the recovery phase is higher than that of the pre uh step. So this is this will give a good insights in the early stages of uh, material formulation and help uh, to improve on uh, brick uh, formulation. And we, we had the opportunity as well to compare the brick effectiveness of various of the market brick pads. They, these are the brick pads that's already in on the road being widely used. So the, the coefficient of friction of value are with uh, on the optimum range of uh, where it's in, 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 in a good range across all the different uh, variables uh, tested in the AK master test. So BP1 is the, the, the previous results I show in the previous slides are all from brick pad number one. We have compared with brick pad two, brick pad three of uh, different makers. Uh, but in, in general, what uh, we can say that from this comparison test is that with the total test duration shortened by 40 or 50% using a small scale test compared to a, a, a large scale test to understand the friction frictional properties of brick pads and brick tests. So the Tribal Lab HD provides a rapid test solution <clears throat> for brick developers who aim to compare the tribological properties of uh, various material formulations during an uh, early stage of development. And the, sh at the, material, the materials that's being shortlisted will then go for a dynamometer test, which where it will be assembled on a brick caliper and something of a, a brick system that resembles an actual vehicle and to be tested on the dyno test that takes about uh, one to two days to complete. So a small scale test will definitely help uh, early adopters in this case. Uh, where has been a, a very important uh, characteristics that have uh, been evaluated, same goes for us. Uh, in this test, we evaluated the test. We monitor the wear of the three uh, different brake pads after the entire AK master test, uh, where it's developers and manufacturers. Uh, this is an important aspect because the material wear rate would symbolize or signal the safety and the braking performance of the, the formulation. So the friction and wear characteristic of brick materials in this test, we are determined in accordance to established standards, measure the thickness difference and also the mass before and after the SAE G2522 test. So a small scale tester such as the Tribal Lab HD, it allows such friction wear characteristics to be accurately determined without influence from the hardware effect and environmental effect experience in a full-scale full tester. This would be this type of approach would be exceptionally helpful for those manufacturing uh, or developing brick pads to, see, to evaluate how effective the breaking performance of the particular brick pads. So I managed to capture the image of the rotor disc in its original state before the test and after the test where you can see the formation of ring which is the uh, tribal layer from the sliding test, you form a tribal layer film on the on the rotor disc after the test, similar to that what happened in our actual brake, you know, in our vehicle. Mm, when there's a, a typical question when people when people will be interested in will be how does the full scale and a small scale friction test how does it vary? Uh, 
we managed to demonstrate uh, a short comparison from one of the brick pads, comparison of, of the SAE J2522 test. So all the tests in this by the web charts uh, are conducted based on J2522 uh, from full scale dynamometer versus a small scale travel lab test. Uh, as you can see here, the two methods show reasonable comparison in terms of uh, mu, where the Traveler HD is, from that we can conclude that the Traveler HD is a preliminary friction material tester that only evaluate tribological properties of the friction materials. So once the friction materials is deemed to be qualified or the brick form formulations that are shortlisted, selected, will be then subjected to a full-scale dynamometer before we big developers will subject to the highest level of test, which is the vehicle test prior to commerce, commercialization. So in, in brick friction material testing, there will be always uh, three stages. The R&D stage where a small-scale test is being used before moving on to a full-scale and then lastly to a, a, a vehicle test on the route to ensure uh, safety uh, and performance compliant. Uh, recent years, like uh, we just mentioned, we have the, we collected some of the non-exhaust particles generated from the sliding test using the uh, cascade impactor, send it for analysis to characterize uh, the three different types of uh, brick pads that we evaluate. So from here, we can actually determine that BP number three, there is a titanium present over here. So this could most likely be, because when we purchase this, uh, the, the, the box does not <coughs> disclose what are the ingredients, what are the composition or the ingredients of the brick pads. Uh, but from the, <coughs> this element analysis, we, can, we could say this is somehow uh, semi-metallic. Uh, then there are just materials of uh, binders and uh, being also uh, detected in the, uh, Test from this test, but for for this uh this test we it gives a general uh, representation that brick particles can actually also be collected well when we are using a small scale tester to perform uh, the test. In in summary, we we'll say that the the based on the tests uh, that we have been done extensively, or well, still tests have been going on. Uh, the Traveler HD demonstrated an effective uh, scaled down approach to quantify the tribological properties of uh, various brick materials, such as a uh, function of contact pressure, velocity, torque, and uh, temperature. So such approach is cost and time effective for applications in the early stages of new formulation development process manufacturing and material optimization, brick pads, wrote to this. Uh, we are moving on to, to improve our uh, scaled down approach is a further optimization of the testing procedure is required to improve data accuracy and reliability on the tribological properties of the friction materials. And that we, since that we are using a electric motor to drive the deceleration, uh, this small scale tester has the ability to potentially replicate uh, regenerative breaking strategies. We don't know how yet, uh, but this is something that we are working on and hopefully we have something interesting on this regenerative breaking to show to you guys uh, in the very near future. Uh, thank you very much and yeah, for your attention and yeah, I think I'll we'll pass back to Sam for the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, Damien. That was, that was fascinating. Um, so I think now everyone will uh, we'll take some questions, please, if you would like to type those into the, uh, into the chat box and we'll address those in a moment whilst we're waiting for audience questions. Um, I think I'll just, uh, I'll sort of kick us off with a couple myself. Um, so I think for uh, a tribologist like myself, I'm uh, reasonably familiar with the, the tribal lab UMT that, that Brooker um, also produces. So I was just curious about uh, if you could expand on some of the differences 
uh, with the the new Tribal Lab HD. I know it's you say it's it's uh, it's specific, you know, for brick testing. But if you could tell us a little more, that would be uh, that would be great. Thanks. And that, uh, thanks, Sam. So uh, to to address that, so basically for the standard the UMD Tribal Lab that uh, a lot of us are familiar with, uh, if you if you notice that the footprint of the instrument will be much smaller because uh, one of the reasons is that on the stand UMT Tribal Lab, we're using a smaller motor. So when we, when we are using a smaller motor, we are actually limited by the, the torque capability that is limited to about 10 Newton meter, 15 Newton meter torques on the standard Tribal Lab system. So uh, when we want to generate, uh, when we want to simulate uh, this different driving scenarios on the Tribal Lab HD that uses a larger motor, we can actually the increase the torque capability by up to up to 10 times more than what we no, five, five times more than what we used to be able to do so this will be this will allow us to actually characterize uh have a larger sample areas to be used so that would actually more similar where we mimic to the actual brick pad because as we know the actual brick pad is large uh, so we are trying to and en when we enlarge the test samples as well, the the torque will definitely increase. That is why we we have this uh, special system to uh, to demonstrate this uh, measurement capability. And at the same time, also these uh, this Tribal Lab HD, as compared to the standard Tribal Lab, it has a, a direct heating feature features that we heat up only in the rotor disk mimics more to what is being done to heat up the the in the, the friction induced heating of the rotor disk in the dynamometer okay that's great thank you we had a question from uh from ali oh a couple of questions for ali let's suggest the first one uh oh he says thanks for the presentation i was wondering how the obtained data from lab scale tests compares to the full scale test results So I think just okay. So yes. what what okay. what is different between what you measure on the Tribal Lab HD compared to uh, your dynamometer tests or full scale? Typically, testing? we we observe the uh, the trend would be the same, but uh, of a full scale dyno test would be we have uh, like what you say it would be a larger. You're going to use an initial fly flywheel. The entire brake pad is larger, mm -hmm. so the resulting torque would be much higher. We can go up to like 80, 100 nanometer newton meters, and this is where the friction will be uh, uh, slightly higher as, as compared to to a small scale tester. But for but for in terms of the trend, like if a fade should be low, lower than a recovery, we will observe the same trend on a full scale test as well as a small scale test. Okay. But it's, it's, it's the small, small scale test, lab scale test will be more to a initial screening test. Okay, thank you. We have a, a second question from Ali, who says, is there a general error factor to convert the data, I guess, between the two scales of testing that you just described? We do apply a, uh, scaling uh, law based on uh, physics where we scale based on the geometry uh, which, let me just bring this to the earlier slides where we use the actual uh, size on the actual material where, where we being tested on a large scale tester we have some scaling down on mathematical complex equations to reduce the, for example, the the force, uh, the speed, to make sure that we we maintain a, we mimic a one to one relationship uh, between a large scale test and a small scale test. So answering to Ali, where is there any general error factor to convert? We use a scaling factor uh, to to do the scaling down. Okay. Thank you. We have a uh, we have a question from Ali. Would just say just says thanks for uh, thanks for answering the question. So we have a uh, 
a question from Richard here who says, for the system with the particle capture setup, could you provide a rough price in GBP? Uh, for this, Richard, I recommend you to contact our sales our salesperson, or we, we will definitely get our when we get your contact, we get our mm -hmm. salesperson to answer answer back on this uh, commercial mm -hmm. aspect of this instruments. Sure, I'll uh, I'll make sure to pass the question on later when I uh, when I send some of the information after the webinar. So. Um, Someone from Brooker will get back to you, Richard, on, on that one. So, okay. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, please do type those in the chat. Um, whilst we're waiting for, for any other questions uh, from the audience, um, just to, because I, 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 don't, I don't know a great deal about, about brake pad materials, and I'm just curious. Uh, you said they were generally inhomogeneous um how much of an effect does that have on uh the results and are there any more homogeneous materials i guess there are both metallic and ceramic um materials are there any uh huge differences in terms of homo homogeneity and the results Typic typically they are formulated intentionally in such a way that it's not homogeneous so when we are so for example if you look at this image at the the back part this entire big of uh, brick pad right so when we are using a small scale test we we actually use three pieces where we selected from different areas on these brick pads so that would somehow mimic the the inhomogeneity mm -hmm. we have to try to capture it for the for the test Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. So I'll we'll just we we'll might give it a give it a couple more minutes to see if there are any other questions from anyone else in the audience. Um, and in the meantime, um, I think we've like to know a little bit more about sort of the, the sort of range of capabilities for the, the tribal lab HD. Like what is I know there are there are obviously specific breaking standards, but what is sort of the maximum speed that you could simulate in your lab scale testing? And you know, to what to, to what extremes could you test is what I'm trying to trying to ask. We uh, for now we are a, we are able to mimic uh, most of the normal root uh, mm -hmm. test uh, parameters in the J2522 with the exception of our motorway applications mm -hmm. that is going beyond like 200 kilometers per hour yeah. uh, that is not in our scope but uh, nonetheless we we covered most of the the normal testing that uh, has been done in the test by uh, brick developers right in the in the AK master test and and also other tests, uh, other standards that we uh, we will start to look into. Okay, very good. Thank you. This has been, certainly been informative for me, as I only uh, only sort of looked a little bit into into the tribology of brake pads. Um, some of my uh, some of my colleagues at the University of Leeds were uh, working into this research. I think uh, interesting. I think some some of them were. Uh, we're we're here today, which is which could be good to see. Um, yeah, perhaps you can share the videos, the information with them, and if, that's, if if it's interesting for them to 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 look into for their research. Absolutely. So for for everyone that registered uh, today, they will be sent the uh, the replay for this. So for for any of you there in the audience, if your colleagues were not able to uh, to attend, that uh, will be sent to them. So I think I think with that. Uh, we don't have any further questions from the audience, so let's uh, let's move on to uh, the end of the webinar. So, with that, uh, I would like to say thank you very much, Damien, for uh, for your talk today, and thank you to those in the audience who asked questions. Uh, it was great to get that uh, great to get that engagement going. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to Brooker for the uh, support to 
run this webinar. We wouldn't be able to uh, to run our our uh, our events without uh, the support of our partners, such as such as Brooker. A uh, quick reminder: please do look at uh, the Surface Ventures website for uh, for archives of our previous events. Uh, we will be organizing our next webinar on the 27th of October. The link to register for this is on, on screen now. Um, additionally, uh, you can sign up to our mailing list on our website, so you can stay tuned um, to any of our uh, any of our next uh, upcoming events. And also, please to, you know, do follow us on LinkedIn as well. We post updates there. Uh, we have our fortnightly newsletter on Surface uh, with our next issue coming out on the 21st of October. Uh, once again, archives of those issues can also be found on LinkedIn. And finally, I'd just like to say um, we would like to ask uh, for your support from our, our audience to take the time to advertise these lectures to your contacts if anyone uh, you know would be interested in this. Uh, so with that, um, See you all next time. Thank you very much for joining today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone.